This episode covers the subject of child abuse, so listener discretion is strongly advised. This case was suggested by a listener who came across Scottish murders by accident when she was having an argument with Alexa. Thanks Moira Hamilton for listening and for the case suggestion. This case is sadly officially an unsolved case, but unofficially many believe they now know the truth which really only began to unravel on a cold, wintry evening in a bedroom in a house in Bells Hill, about 13 miles or 20 kilometres from Glasgow, on the 7th of February 1992, following a tense but long overdue confrontation between two estranged family members, which led to the shocking revelation regarding a 35-year-old missing person case, a revelation that would tear one family apart but bring hope and some answers to another. 11-year-old Moira Anderson lived at 71 Eglinton Street in Coat Bridge in North Lanarkshire, about 11 miles or 18 kilometres east of Glasgow city centre, with her mum Marjorie, or Maisie, dad Andrew, older sister, 13-year-old Janet, and younger sister, 8-year-old Marjorie. The Anderson family were very close and well-known in the area, and while they were not wealthy, they were respected. According to the book Where There Is Evil by Sandra Brown, 11-year-old Moira was a tomboy who had straight, fair hair that framed her pretty, impish face. She had intelligent blue eyes, a bubbly personality with an answer for everything, and was just full of life. While Moira and her older sister were very similar in appearance, and people often got the two girls mixed up, they both had very different personalities and interests. With Moira loving a game of marbles, going swimming and to the theatre to watch films and also accompanying her dad Andrew to football matches. But she didn't have time for dolls or playing skipping. To earn pocket money, Moira would deliver milk in the area every morning as well as carry out odd jobs for her neighbours and mother. Janet, Moira and Marjorie were very close with Janet being very protective of her younger sisters. On Saturday the 23rd of February 1957, Moira, two of her cousins and her mum had planned to visit Moira's grandfather who was in hospital, before then going to the cinema. However, the weather had taken a turn for the worst, and so Moira's mum, Maisie, had decided they would visit the hospital another day, and that she would stay at home, but that Moira could still go to the cinema with her cousins. Before Moira headed off to meet up with her cousins, her mum asked Moira if she would go and visit her gran, who lived about 600 yards or 548 metres from Moira's home, to check if she needed anything, as her gran had come down with the Asian flu. Moira agreed and set off shortly before 4pm. Upon Moira arriving at her gran's home, Moira's uncle Jim, who lived with Moira's grandfather, said that he had bought fish for their tea, but he had not realised there was no butter to cook it in, and would Moira nip to the nearby co-op shop, about 300 yards or 274 metres from Moira's own house, before it closed at 4.15pm to get some. Moira agreed and left. However, the snow was falling heavily now, fast becoming a blizzard, and the wind was biting cold. And despite Moira being wrapped up warmly in a navy blue coat and a pixie hat with red bands, she would have likely felt the cold. As 4.15 came and went, and still there was no sign of Moira, her uncle Jim was initially annoyed, thinking that Moira had no doubt become distracted by a game of marbles being played on the street and lost track of time. However, his annoyance soon changed to anxiety as the time ticked by and Moira did not return. Upon Moira's two cousins arriving at her gran's home to take her to the cinema and Moira not returning from the co-op, it was initially hoped that Moira had maybe, for some reason, gone straight to the cinema to meet up with her two cousins there instead. However, when they arrived at the cinema, there was no sign of Moira. Moira's two cousins thought that Moira had likely turned up back at home and so decided to go into the cinema and watch the film they had planned to. It was only upon their return home and following Moira's parents calling around Moira's friends and family members to see if she was with them that Moira's disappearance was finally realised. By this time her parents were in despair and finally reported Moira missing with the police just after midnight. At first light, search parties were organised and, according to the Airdrie and Coatbridge Advertiser, on the 26th of March 1993, streets, lanes, back courts, sheds, garages, derelict buildings and fields were thoroughly searched without success. 
Cinemas and local libraries, as Moira loved to read, were also opened by managers and searched in the hope that Moira had been locked in by accident. But again, Moira was not found. Although there was hope that Moira may have been found in the early hours of Tuesday morning, when a girl about Moira's age was found wandering in Campus Lang, about nine miles or 14 kilometres west of Coatbridge, in her pyjamas. However, it was quickly established that this was not Moira, but 11-year-old Iris Miller, who'd been staying with her relatives nearby and had become confused. She was taken to hospital as she appeared to be in shock, and her parents were notified. As word spread throughout the community that 11-year-old Moira had disappeared, it became evident that, despite the blizzard conditions that afternoon, there were a number of witnesses to Moira's movements upon her leaving her grandmother's house, and upon an appeal being made by the police for anyone who had information regarding Moira's disappearance or her movements that afternoon to come forward, four separate individuals gave very interesting statements to the police that would definitely give them a new line of inquiry. According to the book Where There Is Evil, one statement was from a James Inglis, who knew all three of the Anderson girls. He said that as the snow and wind picked up on the afternoon of Saturday, the 23rd of February, around about 4pm he had taken shelter in a doorway located across from the bus stop near where Moira's gran lived saying that, as he stood there, he saw Moira playing in the snow at the bus stop. Another statement was given by a woman, who was a policeman's wife, who had boarded the bus shortly after 4pm at the bus stop near Moira's grand's home, and she said that Moira, who she also knew, had boarded the bus in front of her, taking the seat she believed nearest to the driver. This woman had taken a seat further up the bus and had departed by the door in the middle, so she could not be 100% sure that Moira was still on the bus when she left, but had the impression that she was. A third witness also came forward to say she too believed Moira had got on this very same bus. She said she had been looking out of her window, which was directly across from the bus stop, at how awful the weather was getting, and she noticed a young girl playing or possibly searching for something in the snow near the bus stop, shortly before it arrived. The lady continued to look out of her window and noticed that when the bus pulled away, not only had the small group of people who had been standing at the bus stop gone, but so had the little girl, feeling sure that the little girl had also got on the bus. A fourth statement was made, again by a policeman's wife, who was on the bus already when it stopped near Moira's grand's house to pick up passengers, and she said she saw Moira get on the bus and that she and Moira had exchanged a smile before Moira sat in the seat at the front beside the driver and began talking to him. These four people were not the only ones who had seen Moira the very afternoon she disappeared. Others, too, had a story to tell. So it would appear that Moira had most definitely got on the bus that went straight past her home. But why? She was on an errand to the co-op, located yards from her grand's home. Why would she get on a bus? Did she even go to the co-op? Well, the staff at the co-op, who knew Moira, said she had not come to their shop on the Saturday afternoon. They were asked if they had perhaps closed early, and when Moira realised this, that was when she had decided to get on a bus and go into town to carry out the errand instead. But the staff insisted that no, they had not closed early that afternoon. They would still have been open had Moira made it to the shop. So why was Moira on the bus? Well, that reason wouldn't come out for over 35 years. Something else that the public wasn't made aware of until about 35 years after Moira went missing was the fact she had even been on a bus. Up until that point, everyone had assumed that she had just disappeared into thin air that afternoon in the blizzard. However, the fact Moira had been seen on or near the bus the afternoon she disappeared must have been rigorously checked and led nowhere, as on the 26th of February, three days after Moira's disappearance, a senior police officer said, according to the Edinburgh Evening News, that they believed that Moira may have been taken away against her will in a car or a lorry and may possibly now be in England and they were asking for anyone in Britain who had any information about Moira's disappearance to come forward, saying that they were seeking the help of police forces throughout Britain, and that we have done everything we can in Coatbridge. We are now hoping for a lead from the general public. 
police received a lot of supposed sightings of Moira after this, from her being seen at a fun fair in Glasgow to her being forced into a van near Coatbridge to being seen in Doncaster in England and being sighted in other parts of Scotland, which upon all sightings being checked turned out not to have been Moira and led nowhere but a dead end. As the days and weeks passed and there was still no sign of Moira, suspicion began to fall on Moira's family. Her uncle Jim, who had sent Moira on the errand, was questioned repeatedly by the police, as, as far as anyone knew, he was the last person to see her alive. It says in the book Where There Is Evil that whispers followed him around for many years, blighting his life. There was also speculation about whether Moira's mum and dad could have been involved in Moira's disappearance, with Andrew, Moira's dad, being conscious of the ever-present suspicious looks about his involvement, for the simple reason that he was Moira's dad, and false rumours circulated that Moira's mum, Maisie, would punish Moira, and that perhaps a family argument had gone too far. The police did look into these rumours and went as far as searching not only Moira's home in Coatbridge but also her parents' small holiday cabin in the countryside, but nothing untoward was found. A few days after Moira went missing, the grandfather that she, her cousins and Moira's mum were going to visit in the hospital, which was cancelled due to the blizzard, sadly passed away and so as well as the heartache of their daughter going missing, the Anderson family also had to attend a funeral. Despite everything that the Anderson family were going through, Moira's disappearance, a death in the family, the finger-pointing and accusations, when what would have been Moira's twelfth birthday came around on the 31st of March, which is also Mother's Day in the UK, just over a month since Moira had gone missing, her mum, Maisie, insisted on buying the gift that Moira had wanted so dearly. Monopoly. She said to newspapers that she was not yet giving up hope on her daughter being found, and that she believed Moira must have been taken against her will, as she would never speak to strangers. With Moira's dad Andrew backing this up by saying that he believed Moira had been taken away by someone in a car. However, weeks turned to months, and Moira's disappearance continued to baffle everyone involved. Now, despite the police issuing an appeal to the whole of Britain in newspapers early in the investigation, Moira's disappearance was not reported on the television news, and her photo didn't appear anywhere but in newspapers. That was until the weekend of the 18th and 19th of May, three months after Moira's disappearance, after her mum had fought hard for this, getting in touch with her local MP to help her cause. Moira's parents still had not given up hope of finding Moira, feeling sure that the daughter was still alive. And so, following the police initially refusing to approach the BBC to televise a photo of Moira due to the fact that it would apparently serve no useful purpose, in May 1957, the police finally agreed to do this. Accompanied by Moira's photo being shown on TV, which her parents never saw as they didn't have a TV, was her description, what she had been wearing when she went missing, and asking for anyone with any information to come forward. Following it being agreed that Moira's picture would be shown on TV, Moira's mum Maisie said in the Edinburgh News that, I am glad to hear that Moira's picture is to be televised. We have explored every avenue possible. TV is the only medium that hasn't been used. My husband and I both feel that Moira is alive somewhere, saying that they had to know one way or another what had happened to Moira. Sadly, though, nothing came of Moira's picture being televised. The missing person inquiry ground to a halt, and people began to forget. Well, people outside of Moira's family, people outside of the community the Anderson family were part of, these people didn't forget and the suspicions around Moira's family somehow being involved in her disappearance continued, despite there being no foul play found, no body being found, and detectives from Glasgow CID being brought in, and apparently an exhaustive investigation having found no conclusion. But was it an exhaustive investigation that had been undertaken by the police? Had they really followed up every possible lead? Had they followed up every line of inquiry from their door-to-door investigation? No, they hadn't, because a door-to-door inquiry had not taken place, with the police apparently believing that if anyone had information, then they would come forward to the police. Sadly, this did not happen, and all the tidbits and pieces of information that people may have had were lost. 
Many in the community were initially surprised that the police had not come calling, but then they believed that what they had to say obviously hadn't been important and the police must have had other, better lines of inquiry to follow up. But what about the four witnesses who had seen Moira either playing near or getting on the bus and sitting near the driver? What had the driver said when he was interviewed? Well, he said nothing, because he never was interviewed. An officer apparently went to Baxter's bus depot and asked someone there, it's not known who, as the police officer didn't deem it necessary to record who he had spoken to, and asked them if they had seen Moira on their bus that day, to which they had apparently replied no. And that was it. That was the full extent of that line of inquiry preferring to televise an appeal to the wider country instead of following up on a credible lead witnessed by four independent people, two of which were the wives of police officers. Why was this? And who had the driver of the bus been who Moira had apparently been seen speaking to? Life was tough for the Anderson family following Moira's disappearance. Her parents had to endure the awful rumours and finger-pointing of their potential involvement in Moira's disappearance rumours that they had been overly hard with Moira and would punish her more than their other daughters because she was wayward, rumours that Moira had run away to get away from her parents, rumours that she had run away to London and had become a prostitute, awful taunting rumours that were just untrue. Even the police officers gave the impression that Moira had left of her own accord and that she would be back and would be in serious trouble when she did with one former detective saying that there was a distinct lack of urgency around Moira's disappearance. And besides, the police had other, more pressing things to be dealing with at that time, such as a chief constable retiring and a formal dinner being held, his replacement taking over and getting the police station and paperwork in order for an imminent visit of a high-ranking officer. So their focus was elsewhere. Despite the predictions by some officers that Moira would come back when she was ready, she never came back. As the years passed, Moira's sisters married, and her oldest sister Janet moved to Australia, and her youngest sister Marjorie moved to London. When Moira's mum Maisie died in 1977, many believed that Moira would come back for the funeral, that this would be the time when she'd reappear. But she didn't. It wasn't until this time that people really, truly began to believe that Moira might not have disappeared of her own free will at all, that there might actually have been foul play, and that she might not be a missing person, as she was still categorised by the police, but that she had actually been murdered. However, nobody appeared to think at this time that maybe if they had come forward with the information they had, either about the day of Moira's disappearance or of information they had about someone who had been living in the community at the time who potentially could have harmed Moira, then maybe there could be a reinvestigation into Moira's disappearance. This is the story I was researching at the time I saw the talk at CrimeCon by Stop the Killing hosts Sarah and Catherine. I spoke to Catherine Schweit in a recent episode where she said that if you see or hear anything suspicious or see something out of place, report it. Just report it, as it could be the final piece of the puzzle that is needed to break a case and stop a killing. And this resonated with me so much because of what I'm about to tell you next and in part two. Nobody, least of all Sandra Brown, who had been eight years old and living streets away from where Moira's family did when she disappeared and who remembered Moira's disappearance, would have thought that in 1992, 35 years after Moira's disappearance, after a long overdue strained conversation, that Sandra would be the one that could help provide some answers to Moira's family, while at the same time revealing a very dark and shocking secret about her own family. A lot of the information I got for the next part of the story was from the book Where There Is Evil, written by Sandra Brown. Sandra Gartshore lived a few streets away from Moira's family in Coatbridge, and she knew Moira by sight. She had been eight years old when Moira disappeared. At the time of Moira's disappearance, Sandra lived with her mum, Mary, dad, Alex, or Sandy, and her two younger brothers, Norman and Ian. Sandra describes in detail in her book exactly what her childhood was like, so if you would like to know more, I'd highly recommend having a read of Where There Is Evil. 
Initially, Sandra felt like she was the apple of her dad's eye, that he fiercely protected her, feeling this was due to the fact that her mother had sadly suffered numerous miscarriages, and so when Sandra came along, she was extra special to her parents. Both of her parents worked, her dad for the bakery before changing jobs, and her mum cleaning, and they brought in a decent wage, and so her dad, Alex, decided to buy a family car, which was a big deal for the family, as no one else in the street had one, and so attracted a lot of attention. While Alex would take the family on trips in the car to the seaside, he was also just as happy to take Sandra and her friends for trips too. However, it was on one of these trips with Sandra and her friends that Sandra began to realise that there was something seriously wrong. But being only a child, she had no idea just how wrong. Sandra describes in her book that on one occasion when her father had taken her and a number of her friends on a day trip, upon arriving, her father had asked her to go and buy them all ice creams from the van, which was located quite a distance away. However, when she returned to the car, with the ice cream dripping down her hands, she found her dad's car to be locked and the windows steamed up. As she peered into the car, she also noticed clothing lying discarded, before her dad then jumped out of the car laughing and Sandra's friends followed behind him. This would not be the only unsettling incident that Sandra would experience with her father. She also described on another occasion, as she sat in the front passenger seat of her dad's car, he turned to her and began to tickle her under her armpits, before then turning to her friends in the back of the car and tickling them, although Sandra noticed with concern and discomfort that he didn't tickle them under their armpits, but instead pulled at their knickers and grabbed at their chest. Sandra turned away, knowing in her heart something just didn't feel right and Sandra's feelings for her dad began to change, and so too did his temperament. Sandra no longer felt able to run unabashedly to her father for hugs and tickles, which changed his attention towards Sandra, and he started to become violent. He would regularly beat Sandra with his belt, ensuring to use the brass buckle, and always in places that would not show, as well as holding a spoon from his hot tea against her skin, both of which gave him great pleasure and Sandra tried her hardest to stay out of his way. One day, her mother asked her to take her father's sandwiches at work for his lunch, and when Sandra got there, she came across her dad in a compromising position with one of his colleagues. He was so angry and shouted at her to get out. She ran to the house of one of her relatives who lived nearby to tell them what had happened, so upset that her dad would tell her mum and her mum would be angry at her. The relative calmed Sandra down and told her that would not happen, and if she went back to see her dad, he would likely be happy to see her, which he was. Perhaps fearing that Sandra would tell her mother what she had seen, her dad began to treat her mother a lot better, for a while. One weekend, he arranged for Sandra, her two younger brothers and her mother to go to the pictures to see The Wizard of Oz. However, shortly after arriving at the cinema, much to Sandra's dismay, her two younger brothers began to scream the place down, and so they had to leave. However, Sandra's dad had promised them fish and chips for their tea, so they merrily made their way home. Upon arriving home, Sandra threw open the kitchen door and skipped into the living room, only to be met with her father on the couch with a neighbour's two-year-old child, half-dressed and looking bewildered. Sandra's mother was shocked and a quarrel ensued between her mum and dad. Not long after this, Sandra's dad announced that it was time he started going out more on an evening with his wife and so he arranged for a colleague's 13-year-old sister called Betty to babysit Sandra and her two brothers on numerous occasions and every time Sandra's dad would insist on driving Betty back home alone. It was around this time when the friend Sandra had, who would come to her house to play, as well as go on trips in the family car, told her that they were no longer allowed to come to her house or go on any more trips in the car, and these friends began to drift out of Sandra's life, and so Sandra spent more and more time in the house, getting lost in reading books she loved, which greatly annoyed her father, who regularly would shout at her to get out and play. Sandra continued to do her best to ignore him, eventually asking that a lock be put on her door so she could have a sanctuary. And then suddenly, one day, just before Christmas 1956, her father disappeared, with Sandra being told by her mother that he had gone into hospital. 
Sandra noticed at this time that any children at school she was still friendly with started acting strangely towards her, and she noticed when she was out with her mother that neighbours would huddle together in groups, whispering and avoiding her mother. Her dad reappeared again briefly in January 1957, in time for Sandra's eighth birthday, before disappearing again in April 1957, after Moira Anderson had disappeared in February, and Sandra was told he would be gone for a long time. In fact, it would be about 18 months before her father reappeared in January 1959, just before Sandra's 10th birthday, and the verbal and physical abuse towards Sandra started again. However, while her father had been gone, Sandra and her mum had established a new life where they were both stronger and neither of them would allow Alex to dominate and rule as he had before. Upon returning home once again, Sandra's dad continued being unfaithful to her mum, with her mum regularly confronting the women he was seeing at their homes, taking Sandra along with her, before he eventually left the family home and ran away with one of his colleagues to Leeds in England, where him and his mistress set up home together and Sandra's mum eventually filed for divorce. Life was hard for Sandra after her dad left, and as well as attending school and studying for her exams, Sandra would work all hours cleaning with her mum to help the family stay afloat. Despite this, Sandra continued with her education, although it was touch and go for a while as the family were extremely hard up for money and she almost had to give up education and get a full-time job before going on to college where in 1970 Sandra graduated with a teaching diploma. During her college years, Sandra met her future husband, Ronnie Brown, and after graduating, they both got jobs and began their married life together. In 1981, shortly after Sandra, who was then 36, had given birth to her daughter, the family moved to Pitlochry in the Scottish Highlands, as Ronnie had taken a job there. Sandra loved living in Pitlochry, and describes in her book that Pitlochry was typical of communities 30 years prior and very much like a neighbourhood in Coat Bridge, where everyone knew everyone else, and people felt able to allow their children out to play whenever they liked, believing that they would come to no harm. The Brown family spent a number of years in Pitlochry, with Sandra teaching art in a private school and helping to run the playgroup, as well as taking part in the amateur dramatics club there. It would be during a pantomime performance at the town hall that had been put on by the Amateur Dramatic Club where Sandra first became aware that her family had been keeping a terrible secret from her. A former neighbour of Sandra's family in Coatbridge also was at the same pantomime as Sandra and having immediately recognised Sandra after the performance she approached her to say hello. The pair chatted briefly about the neighbourhood and memories growing up before this woman then went on to drop a bombshell. She began to make Sandra feel uncomfortable when she mentioned that she remembered Sandra's dad too, saying, according to Where There Is Evil, I remember your dad particularly well. Big, tall, handsome bus driver with dark hair, right? Before Sandra could reply, the woman carried on. He'd a wee black car, hadn't he? And he was a great one for the ladies. But I always felt sorry about what happened to him, you know? Sandra didn't know, and so she smiled politely and shook her head. The woman went on to tell Sandra, as they stood in the Pitlochry town hall after the children's pantomime, that between 1957 and 1959, her father had been in prison for raping Sandra and her brother's 13-year-old babysitter, Betty. Sandra was in shock, but she remembered back to this time, when she would have been about eight years old, and how her father had disappeared for an extended period of time, and her being told that he was in hospital. No, this couldn't be true. Her mother wouldn't have kept something so important from her all these years, would she? Sandra confronted her mother, and her fears were confirmed with her mum defending herself for never having told Sandra by saying that she was only trying to protect her. Despite Sandra being in shock at this news and having been kept in the dark for so long, what her mother said next shook her. Her mother told her that it hadn't been rape anyway, as the 13-year-old girl was very promiscuous and was always around the bus drivers. It just happened to have been Sandra's dad who had got caught, ending by saying she was a wee tart. Sandra couldn't believe what she was hearing. Her mother was actually defending her father, 
was trying to excuse the actions of a 36-year-old man against a 13-year-old girl, a man who had run away with his mistress after cheating on his wife. But despite Sandra stating this to her mother, her mother wouldn't hear it. Realising she would get no more information from her mother, Sandra turned to her father's mum to see if she would provide more details. But her granny Jenny told her that it was such a long time ago now and she hated talking about it. She did say, though, that after their son Alex was arrested and found guilty of this awful crime, it changed her husband, Alex's dad, and that he never was the same person again, saying that Alex's dad never harmed a soul, but he always said your daddy killed, before she stopped suddenly, shocked by what she was about to say, before ending by saying she meant he basically killed all the love his dad had for him when he was arrested for that awful crime. Sandra's mother and grandmother refused to talk about the subject any further, and over time Sandra had no choice but to try and put it from her thoughts, although this was easier said than done. However, Sandra was able to carry on with her life, and Sandra and Ronnie got other jobs, and the Brown family, being Ronnie, Sandra and their two children, Lauren and Ross, eventually moved to Edinburgh, and Sandra's thoughts were taken up with her husband, her children and her career. That was until February 1992, when Sandra's thoughts going forward would involve terrible, long-held family secrets. In February 1992, Sandra had established a very successful career in teaching, rising to the rank of Senior College Lecturer in Child Care in West Lothian, about a 40-minute drive west of where Sandra stayed with her family in Edinburgh. For the first week in February, Sandra had been attending a management course which included assertiveness training for her role and everyone there had found it quite an emotional week. On the last day of the course, already being drained from the training, Sandra received an early morning phone call from her husband telling her that her granny Jenny, who had been admitted to hospital earlier in the week, had sadly passed away. Sandra was devastated, always having been really close to her dad's mum, despite her dad Alex leaving his family in Coatbridge 27 years prior and Sandra not having seen or spoken to him since. Sandra agreed she would go and collect her mother in Coatbridge after her training finished for the day and they would both travel to Granny Jenny's home in Bells Hill, about a 12-minute drive south of Coatbridge, to begin the process of going through Granny Jenny's affairs and to discuss her funeral. Later that afternoon, Sandra's mum Mary got into Sandra's car and they began the short journey to Granny Jenny's home. Sandra's mum turned to Sandra and told her that she should know that her father had arrived that afternoon from Leeds and was staying at Granny Jenny's house. Sandra initially was shocked. Was this really the right time to be seeing her father after 27 years? However, that very morning, Sandra had taken part in an assertiveness role-playing exercise which had been about what she would say to her father if and when she saw him. And so, yes, she was ready. She knew exactly what she was going to say to him. She just wasn't expecting to hear what he said in reply. Sandra and her mum arrived at Granny Jenny's house and were soon face-to-face -face with Alex, who was now 71 years old. An uncomfortable silence enveloped everyone, and so Sandra took this opportunity to say to her father that she would like to speak to him, with him suggesting that the conversation take place in Granny Jenny's bedroom for a bit of privacy. Once in the bedroom, sitting inches apart on the bed, Sandra took a deep breath and began to tell him exactly what she thought of him, of how he had treated her as a child, how he had made her feel, to him running away and leaving his family and then finally telling him she was disgusted when she found out that he'd been in prison for raping their 13-year-old babysitter. Sandra said that her father appeared shocked by her outburst, and when she had finished, he began to make excuses for his behaviour, saying that his mother had always loved his brother more, and that nobody ever gave him a chance. But Sandra was having none of it, shouting at him that this was a lie. He had had chance after chance from her mother. He agreed that yes, Sandra's mum had given him chances, as had his own mum, but he went on to say that his father never could forgive him. Sandra didn't understand this, as she had since learned that his father had been a tower of strength during her father being arrested for his babysitter's rape, starting petitions and getting church scores to write about how well thought of Alex was in the community. So she asked him what he meant by this. Sandra was not prepared for his answer. 
According to Sandra's book, Where There Is Evil, her father said, after a long silence, he wouldn't forgive me for the Moira Anderson thing. Sandra felt her world shift, unconsciously perhaps realising that this statement would change the course of her life forever. He continued, not realising just how much his words were impacting Sandra. I was the driver of the bus the day she went missing. I told Grandpa I didn't even know her, but she got on my bus. I was the last to speak to her. I was the last person to see her. He stopped there, but Sandra filled in the unsaid word, alive. He was the last person to see Moira Anderson alive. This was not what Sandra had been expecting when she had confronted her father after 27 years. She didn't know what to do with this information. If he had been the last person to see Moira alive, then had he been included in Moira's missing person investigation? Had he been interviewed? Alex replied that yes, he had been, saying that he had told the police at the time the same as he had his dad, that he hadn't even known Moira. But somehow Sandra knew. She just knew that he was lying. She felt sure that her father had known Moira. It was a close-knit community. And if he was lying about that, what else was he lying about? Sandra had no idea then just what hell this confrontation with her father would unleash. That's the end of part one, and believe me, this story has only just begun. The path that Sandra's confrontation with her father would take her on would be long and sometimes lonely filled with truly shocking revelations, revelations that not everyone wanted to come to light. But would these revelations lead to Moira Anderson finally receiving justice? Join us next time for part two to find this out and so much more. And just before I go, I'd like to give a quick shout out to another new Patreon member. Thank you so much to Lady of Innerwick Castle for your support. We really appreciate you.